Welcome back to Rappahannock Issues. I'm Tom Cohen. We're talking about the Supreme Court and the decisions and the issues be coming before this session. I'm here with Travis Braitwood, who is with Texas A&M University at Kingsville. And so uh, we've talked about uh, Scalia and uh, how processes go on. So what are cases uh, facing the court this term do you think are most fascinating that bring you most interest? Oh, we've got a few this term that are really exciting. Um, a lot of them about maybe three of the most prominent ones are from my state here of Texas. Um, the first that we heard last year in uh, uh, early December was a case called Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. Uh, this case dealt with whether or not race may be considered for the purposes of mission, admission for higher education. Um, uh, higher education uh, universities, colleges, they're one of the few areas in the, in the United States where race may be considered a preference. And so up until now, the court has said you can't use quotas, you can't use point schemes, but you may consider it a factor to achieve a critical mass of diversity. The problem is, is that nobody knows what the words critical mass mean, including the Supreme Court who wrote them. <laughs> so we already heard this case once before, a couple years ago. They sent it back down to rehear the case to clarify, and now it's back again. It's now Fisher 2, the sequel. And we're seeing um, whether or not, uh, but for the fact that she was white, would Abigail Fisher been admitted to this university? And can... Will the court tolerate that consideration of race and admission? And they've sort of cut, uh, had several rulings over the past tech decade, I guess, uh, oh, yeah. where they've changed the whole concept of admissions to college and all. Oh yes, going back to the starting in the the mid seventies, they initially said that they could you could consider race, but they said they eliminated the use of quotas, and then they keep restricting this further and further. And in all other areas, pretty much for private contracts or governmental contracts with private entities. For primary and secondary schools, they said race may not be a factor in admissions or consideration, and universities and colleges tend to be the only thing left where it can be. All right. And, and what other cases? Um, they, probably one of the most covered is the abortion issue, and that is a case, uh, uh, out of again, out of the state of Texas. It was just argued, um, I think, a couple days ago. It was March 2nd, I think, was the date it was argued. Um, and it was a case called Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt. Um, it's the issue of a number of states have passed laws that have tried to restrict access to abortion. Um, the primary ways that they've gone about doing this are requiring um, either they'll either make abortion illegal after a certain date, such as 60 or days or something like that. They will require abortion providing facilities to um, adapt the facilities to be similar to hospitals, namely things like wider hallways, which as you can imagine is incredibly expensive. You'd have to basically build a new building. Um, and then also to require doctors performing abortions to have admitting privileges at hospitals. Um, so the, the result of this is that over 20 abortion providing facilities in Texas have closed or are slated to close. The question then becomes, um, the guiding principle here is that in a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, is that um, abortion may not be restricted um, pre-fetal viability and abortion uh, restrictions may not um, cause an undue burden on women seeking lawful abortions. So the question then becomes, has, does the state of Texas have a legitimate claim to protect the health and safety of women, or do these restrictions upon these abortion-providing facilities constitute an undue burden by requiring these facilities to meet ex very extreme standards, and then when they close, forcing women to then drive very long distances, since Texas is an enormous geographic state, um, and whether or not that constitutes a violation of the principles found to be um, guaranteed constitutionally in Fisher. And, and like the uh, affirmative action or the uh, quota ones and with colleges and college admissions, um, the court has sort of shifted slightly about abortion as well over the years. Oh, yeah. They've um, initially they started, of course, with Roe versus Wade, which simply created a trimester scheme. And then now they've moved into this notion of fetal viability and, and looking not just at health and safety of the mother, but the undue burden caused by um, states to restrict access. That said, though, in the interim period, especially in the 90s, they have upheld a number of state restrictions on access to abortion. Uh, any other cases? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's maybe one or two others that are pretty uh, pretty prominent. Um, I think one of the other ones for electoral purposes to sort of move us out of the hot button issues is we could look at another case again out of Texas. All the three events so far, um, Evanwell versus Abbott. It deals with the Voting Rights Act. So somewhat famously, a year or two ago, the Supreme Court um, struck down the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Namely, a number of counties and states had to, if they were going to redraw their district lines, had to have those redrawings. Uh, certified by the Justice Department because of past race-based discrimination. The Supreme Court struck down that pre-clearance provision. And so now what we see is a number of states have enacted changes to their redrawing of their lines. 
Texas has said that they want to, in regards to redrawing their state district boundaries, whether or not when looking at population, do we have to look at the number of eligible voters, the number of registered voters, or the number of people? In other words, when I draw the lines, do I have to look at children, felons who can't vote, illegal immigrants, or do I only look at the people who could vote within a geographic boundary to determine where I draw the lines? And you can imagine pretty easily how this would have radically different outcomes depending upon state population if we suddenly don't have to count people. Um, and so we're seeing now really getting an answer for what does one person, one vote mean in terms of representation. And any, any feel for which way um, they'll go on that or any decisions they've been making in the past about redistricting? That one's a bit more difficult to pin down. That one was actually argued back in December when Scalia was still on the court. Um, it's, it seemed from the oral arguments um, that it looked like they were going to go, uh, they were going to find against the state of Texas and that the idea that you can ignore people simply because they're not registered or ineligible to vote does not seem to fit with the principles of representation. But it's so, it's so hard to tell from oral arguments. There have been some political science research articles that have looked at the number of questions asked to justices as a means of prediction, and they're pretty accurate. But it's still so hard to, to get a clear indication, especially now that we've lost Scalia where it's going to go. Well, and it's funny because speaking of Texas, I think it was in Texas where in one county, um, an inmate, this is way back when prisoners could vote, an inmate ran for mayor. And since there were more citizens, more people in the prison than outside the prison, he actually got elected mayor. Some states do allow um, felons to vote. And so it's, it's quite possible you could have instances like that. Most states, though, have been restrictive about it. And technically, it is permissible to restrict access for voting for felons because of the way the 14th Amendment is worded. So. And, and being from Boston, we, you know, we had our, our, our former mayor who was elected while in prison. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there, that's, there's also some famous cases of that, sure. <laughs> uh, we have less than a minute left, so I just want to thank you for being on and uh, st stress to people uh, to look you up. It's Travis Braidwood, uh, B-R-A-I-D-W-O-O-D, um, and he is at the University in Texas. It's Texas A&M, um, and you've written a couple of interesting articles. One uh, that was published last December, which is on earmarks and pork legislation, pork projects. Um, and then you have a new one that's coming out about ballot measures and whether or not how people vote um, differs on whether or not it's specific in a ballot measure or what the money is going to be spent for, uh, which is interesting because we always hear that, um, mm. that you know, people will never vote for it. But if, if I'm living in Florida, senior citizens will vote for tax increases for schools if they know it's going to go to school. So that's an interesting take. Um, so thank you, uh, Travis, for being here today. I want to make sure that people uh, come back to watch Rappahannock Issues and see us on cbtvnetwork.net and check us out on the radio as well. And um, keep an eye out for Travis and see what he's up to. So come back and see Rappahannock again and pay attention to what our courts are doing.